On 13th of January, 1717, a German woman described as courtly and well-mannered, very skilled at watercolour and very diligent, died in Amsterdam. As a young woman, Maria Sibylla Merian had been destined for an unremarkable life by 17th century standards, marriage, children, and modest success as a tutor and painter of pretty floral watercolours. By the time of her death, however, her important scientific publications graced noble and learned li libraries across Europe. For the next 200 years, Merian's findings would be discussed and debated, her name fated in academic circles from France to Russia, and her books reprinted, most recently in 2016. 18 years after her death, her publications were used as a key source by Carolus Linnaeus in his research for his magisterial system of nature. Within a century, some of her finest works had been acquired by George III, joining the important scientific library he formed at Buckingham House. A recent paper has argued that she was the first ecologist. A number of species on a merian in both scientific and common names, including the caterpillar of the pale tussock moth, which in Dutch is delightfully called the Merianspoorstel or Merian's brush, and a subspecies of the split banded owlet butterfly, which in 1902 was named by the German entomologist Hans Stickel, Opsiphanes Cassina Merianae, in honour, as Stickel himself wrote, of Madame Merian. Merian's story is by any standards inspirational. And her influence as an artist and a naturalist is profound. But how did this happen? I would like to use the next hour to look in more detail at Merian's life and legacy before turning to her works in the Royal Collection, which are artistic innovations as well as scientific treasures. I'd like to end by describing some of our ongoing research into these objects, work in progress which is discovering how Merian's drawings and prints can reveal more about the life and art of this most incredible woman. Maria Sibylla Merian was born in Frankfurt in 1647, the daughter of the printmaker Matthias Merian and his second wife, Johanna Sibylla. Matthias Merian was the head of a large and successful printing workshop, which specialised in maps, topographical prints and book illustrations. If you wanted to buy a view of Frankfurt, an illustrated book on the cosmos, or medicine, or exotic lands, or a portrait of a dashing ruler in mid-17th century Europe, there was a strong chance that your purchase would be produced by the Merian workshop. Maria Sibylla was not born into great wealth or nobility, but her family name was an important artistic brand, and one which she would proudly use throughout her life, even during her marriage describing herself as the daughter of Matthias Merian. The little Maria Sibylla did not just inherit her father's name. She also inherited an artistic talent, one which was recognised by her stepfather, Jacob Marrell. Marrell married Maria's mother after Matthias Merian died in 1650, when Maria was just three years old. Marrell was a talented still-life painter, and I suspect he was also a kind man, as he encouraged his stepdaughter's artistic talents. Under Marrell, Maria learnt to paint still life watercolours, flowers in watercolour on vellum, a type of drawing which was popular among collect collectors and was considered suitable for female artists. This skill would ensure that she could earn an independent living for herself. Someone also taught the young girl printmaking. We're not certain who this was, but in a busy print shop, there'd have been no shortage of very able tutors. In 1665, Maria married one of her stepfather's apprentices, Johann Andreas Graf, a painter and printmaker who specialised in the detailed views of church interiors which were popular in Northern Europe, Northern Europe at the time. The young couple moved to Nuremberg, where Maria began teaching flower painting to wealthy young women. She gave birth to their first daughter, Johanna, in 1668. In 1675, Merian published the first part of a book of flower patterns, this was her first foray into publishing, the book produced with the help of her husband, but proudly proclaiming her status as Matthias Merian's daughter. The flower compositions were intended to be used by young women, like those Merian taught, 
as models for embroidery and watercolour painting. A second daughter, Dorothea, followed in 1678. So far, so predictable. Maria Sibylla Merian was a talented artist, but her life, as I have described it, was not unusual for female artists at the time. Such artists as Maria Man Van Oosterwijk, Rachel Rausch, and Elisa Witthoos were producing similar work. Marriage, children, and work as a teacher of watercolor painting would be all that Merian's parents and society envisaged for her. But alongside this traditional path, Merian was striking out in an unusual direction. She was carrying out original entomological research and preparing to publish her results. Not only this, but she'd chosen to work in the new and groundbreaking field of insect metamorphosis. Merian herself tells us that she bred her first caterpillar in 1660 at the age of 13 years old. She first witnessed silkworm metamorphosis and became fascinated by the change from egg to pupa to cocoon to moth. Soon she was collecting caterpillars in the gardens around her home, carefully feeding and watching them and recording them grow and change. She kept a notebook for her meticulous observations, both in text and watercolour pictures. Her written notes show she was studying the timing of individual metamorphoses. One finds these caterpillars in August, she wrote of one specimen. They spin a chrysalis in September and stay thus over winter until in March of the following year they become butterflies. She also recorded eating habits, behavioural traits and careful descriptions of the appearance of each animal. These notes sat alongside her watercolour studies in which different stages of life cycles were scattered across small sheets of paper and her watercolour studies are very much in, in composition like, the, like the, the illustration you see on, on the screens here. Sometimes, she recorded, people gave her caterpillars to study, among them a puss moth caterpillar, which was brought to her from Leiden. And this watercolour is based on her studies of that caterpillar that came from Leiden. As well as recording the puss moth life cycle, she was interested to observe the caterpillar's reaction to stress, recording it both in a calm posture at the bottom and in a defensive posture at the top. In her notebook, she described the, the two flagelli which appear when the caterpillar is threatened as red horns. Although insect metamorphosis is still a subject of some mystery, our knowledge of the process is far advanced from that of Merian's day. In the 17th century, it was still widely believed that insects were born by spontaneous generation from rotting matter and that the butterfly was therefore a new being born from the remains of the dead caterpillar. Butterflies were often seen as a symbol of the resurrection and appear as such in paintings and prints, such as this print by Albrecht Dürer. If you look at the very bottom right-hand corner, you can see a butterfly there as a symbol of the resurrection, um, which is um, you know, the future of, of the child on Mary's lap. And here on the rest in the flight into Egypt, if you notice, Christ is holding a butterfly in his hands, again as a symbol of the resurrection. In the mid-17th century, a number of researchers started to explore this life cycle and to develop an understanding of the process of metamorphosis. Among them were Francesco Redi, an Italian scientist who proved that insects were not born from rotting matter by placing meat in a variety of jars and showing that insects only appeared on those which were left unsealed. The insects could not, therefore, be developing from the rotting meat itself. In the Netherlands, the artist Jan Gerdaar studied the different insect life stages, carefully illustrating each one in his book on metamorphosis. And at the same time, Jan Swammerdam used a microscope to examine chrysalises, looking for the butterfly inside the caterpillar. Swammerdam developed the most interesting means of explaining metamorphosis as different stages of the same life cycle, rather than a succession of different animals. We do not believe, he pointed out, that the chicken and the egg are two different creatures, although they look very different. The same is true of the caterpillar and the butterfly. Merian was working at an interesting time for the study of metamorphosis, and it is clear that she read the works of Kurda, Swamadan, and others, since she cites them in her own research. But in 1660, when she began to breed and study caterpillars, most of this research had not yet been published. Jan Kurda 
issued his book on metamorphosis from 1662, and Francesco Redi published his experiments on spontaneous generation in 1668. In the same year, Stefan Blankart published his study of butterflies and moths, which included some exotic specimens taken from cabinets of curiosities. Jan Swammerdam would publish his Natural History of Insects in 1669. The young Maria Sibylla Merian was at the cutting edge of a scientific breakthrough. In 1679, Merian published her own contribution to the debate, De Raupen Wunderbare Verwandlung und Sonderbare Blumennahrung, or On the Wonderful Transformation of Caterpillars and Their Particular Nourishment. This took the form of still life depictions of metamorphoses, with each stage of the life cycle shown together on the food plant particular to the caterpillar. Alongside each description was a descriptive, or each depiction was a descriptive text. You can just see it on the slight left hand side of the image there. And that crucially gave the colours of each of the animals she depicted, because the book was published in black and white. Merian, who'd bred caterpillars for herself, had realised that they had very specific requirements and that she needed to note the plants which accorded them that particular nourishment, as she described it. This dual interest led her to develop a new way of illustrating her publications. Rather than showing the different stages of an insect's life cycle in rows, like Swammerdam, if I go back, in rows like that, she portrayed them in elegant still life compositions with each caterpillar portrayed on the correct host plant. And it's actually quite difficult to, to conceive today how, just how unusual and special that was. And I couldn't work out why till I went back to the, the Ladybird book of caterpillars and moths, which I had as a child, and realized this is exactly how it's done in that Ladybird book, and this is how we do it today. But it's Merian, the artist, who really thinks of this. As an artist, Merian was able to arrange the plates of her books in elegant compositions. As a naturalist, she ensured that they, were, that they communicated a strict accuracy and produced an accompanying text to describe what she was seeing. The Raupen book was enough of a success that Merian published a second part in 1683. Merian published the Raupen book as Maria Sibylla Grafin, nay Merian, thus acknowledging both her father and her husband. But by 1683, when the second publication was issued, she was living apart from Graf, having returned to live with her mother after Jacob Merrill's death. In 1685, Merian, her mother and her daughters took the unusual step of leaving Frankfurt to travel to Friesland in the northeast of the Netherlands, where they joined a religious community based at Walter Castle. They may have decided to join Merian's stepbrother, Caspar, who was already a member of the group. The community at Walter were Labadists, who followed the strict teachings of the French priest, Jean de Labadie. Members were expected to give up personal possessions and work together for the good of the community. Despite this rule, Merian was able to retain her drawings and her notebooks and to continue her research. And this watercolor of the life cycle of a frog is based on studies that she took while she was living at Walter Castle. She collected the frog spawn near the castle and brought some back to rear placing a piece of bread in the water as food. As always, she was delighted by the transformations, describing the froglets that emerged as like little crocodiles. As the drawing shows, Merian was as interested in amphibian metamorphosis as she was in the insect life cycle. And one of her great charms is that she seems to have been alert to the wonders of the world and determined to explore everything she encountered, be it tiny ants, huge reptiles, the practicalities of wine production, or new ways of printmaking. And Walter Castle opened up a whole new world for Merian and her daughters to explore. The Labadists were led by the Sommelsdijk sisters. Their brother, Cornelis van Ersen van Sommelsdijk, was abroad in the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America, where he had been governor from 1683. Sommelsdijk sent specimens of Surinamese wildlife back to the castle where a seven metre long stuffed tree snake was displayed. And groups of Labadists, including Sommelsdijk's sisters, traveled to Suriname to set up communities there. It was probably at Balta that Merian first encountered the wildlife of Suriname and where she made connections that would later prove vital for her research. 
and in 1691, the community of Alta Castle broke up, dispersed by illness. Marion and her daughters made their way to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was the obvious place for the Marian women to base themselves. Not only was it the centre of a thriving artistic community where they could all, as trained artists, make a living, but the city hosted a lively scientific community with which Marian soon made contact. As a port city, Amsterdam was the destination of many of the ships which sailed from Dutch colonies around the globe. Many of the sailors on these ships brought back specimens of exotic species, which they knew they could sell to the collectors of cabinets of curiosities within the city. These collectors included the textile merchant, Levinus Vincent, who had a famous collection of plants, insects, and animals. Vincent's cabinet was regarded as one of the wonders of Amsterdam, and among those who visited to see its treasures were Peter the Great. Marion also came to know the curator of the Hortus Medicus, later the Botanical Garden in Amsterdam, Caspar Comelin, who published a number of works on exotic botany. What I'm showing you is not one of his works, but one by his uncle, Jan Comelin, a professor of botany, because in the background here, you can see that Hortus Medicus. This was published at the time we know Marion was working in the gardens. Through her Amsterdam contacts, she found herself in touch with an international community of scholars who exchanged ideas and specimens. Among them was the apothecary James Pettiver, who lived in London, and who had become an important link to England for Merriam. In her visits to the curiosity cabinets in the city, Merriam encountered exotic insects, and she marvelled at their beauty. But she was also frustrated by what she saw. The contents of the cabinets were dead specimens, pinned to boards or ranged in drawers. She could discover nothing about their life cycles how the butterflies and moths, which she saw pinned into cases and illustrated in books, developed from eggs through caterpillars and larvae to become the colourful winged insect she was able to admire in Amsterdam. All this, she wrote, stimulated me to take a long and costly journey in order to pursue my investigations further. On the 12th of February, 1699, therefore, she placed an advertisement in the Amsterdamske Courant informing readers that the contents of her studio, her prints, publications, copper plates, her herbs, her pigments, were all for sale through the dealer Jan Peter Sulmer. With her daughter Dorothea, she was preparing to undertake the hazardous trip to Suriname to study insects in the wild. At this time, Suriname was a Dutch colony. It was mainly concerned with sugar production, and, with the, ma and the majority of European residents were based in the capital, Paramaribo, Although the hot and humid climate of Suriname proved challenging to European settlers, many were struck by its natural beauty. George Warren, who published a description of the country in 1667, recorded the landscape as being high and mountainous, having plain fields of a vast extent, here and there beautified with small groves, like islands in a green sea, amongst whose still flourishing trees it is incomparably pleasant to consider the delightful handiworks of nature. Cornelis van Eersen van Sommelsdijk noted that the landscape here is indescribably beautiful. The ships which regularly sailed between Amsterdam and Suriname carried home descriptions of this attractive land and specimens of unusual plants and animals, unlike anything which had been seen in Europe. As we have seen, Merian had contacts in the country through the Labadist community she had had a glimpse of the riches of Surinamese wildlife, but she also knew people in the colony who had made the journey ahead of her. <coughs> On their arrival, Marion and Dorothea took a house in Paramaribo. We don't know where it was, but it might have looked a little bit like one of these. We know that it had a garden, as Marion used it to grow some of the plants she needed for her research. But unlike her compatriots, Marion did not remain confined to this settlement. She was determined in the pursuit of her research, making expeditions with local guides into the surrounding countryside and forests to search for specimens to breed and study. Once she was settled, she made longer journeys. In April 1700, she travelled along the river to the Providence Plantation, where the Sommelsdijk sisters were based. Here, Marion and Dorothea studied the white witch moths that fed on the gumbo limbo trees, noting that the caterpillars changed from green to red before becoming cocoons. They bred each of the caterpillars, 
carefully recording each stage of their development in watercolours and written notes. They used a magnifying glass to study each of their specimens closely, and Merian would later describe how the wings of a Menelaus blue morpho butterfly looked like roof tiles in detail, and that the red cracker butterfly should be studied under magnification to appreciate its true beauty. They noted the dates on which each life stage began and examined the habits of the different species, noting, for example, that the vine sphinx moth caterpillars ate voraciously and contracted when threatened, while a southern armyworm moth caterpillar was slow and sluggish. Merian's close observations led her to distrust the, asser distrust the assertion of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a pioneer of the microscope, that some caterpillars had eyes along the length of her bodies. Although she didn't have the advantage of a microscope, Merian was right, and she complains in her text about this particular catalogue here in Leonhook, and the way she establishes it is to look at the caterpillar eating and to realise that it cannot see food next to it or behind it, it can only see food in front of it. Marian is, Maria Sibylla Merian is nothing if not brilliantly, brilliantly practical. Where she could not as observe herself, she collected local testimony, recording it with a careful disclaimer that she could not verify the information. It is clear that Marion was awed by the insects she saw, and her written account of her trip is peppered with superlatives, which give us a sense of her reaction. The Dido long-winged butterfly was very beautiful. The Menelaus blue morpho flew very fast. The wings of the Toysa owl butterfly were a beautiful blue. The green Urania moth was gleaming like gold and silver, and she uses gold paint on this illustration to try and make her illustration gleam in the way that the butterfly itself does. And the caterpillar of the gaudy sphinx moth was beautifully embellished with white. Research was satisfying, but Merian was also beset by frustrations. Her work was plagued by wasps and ants, on which she made notes even as she swatted them away. Caterpillars died or ate their way out of the wooden boxes in which she stored them, one night, she was woken by the noise of the, but of the lanternflies which she was storing in a box, and which gave her a terrible fright. Some of the creatures she studied were poisonous, as she found out to her cost when she tried to pick up a very hairy white caterpillar. They are very poisonous, she wrote. If one touches them with the hand, it swells up immediately and is very painful, as I discovered myself. Merian's interests strayed beyond insect metamorphosis. She also studied the amphibian life cycle, particularly that of the strange Suriname toad, which incubates its young in blisters on the skin of its back. Merian was amazed to see one of these toads with the young hatching. She was able to capture it and preserve it, and from this specimen made a careful drawing. She sought out different fruits and tasted them, interested in what could be cultivated more effectively. She was amazed to find that Suriname where grapes grew in abundance, imported all its wine from Europe. She gathered the bulbs of the Barbados lily, which she sent back to Amsterdam to be grown there. Her curiosity and investigative spirit marked her out from the crowd, and there is a sense of sadness in her rueful comment that the inhabitants of Suriname mocked me for seeking anything other than sugar. Merian planned to stay some years in Suriname, but she became ill and had to cut her research short in June 1701 when she returned to Amsterdam. As indomitable as ever, she continued her observations on the journey, despite her illness and the difficult conditions. It was on board the ship home that she successfully reared a monkey slug moth, which you can see on the leaf right up to the top right of that illustration, noting that the caterpillar was a very unusual kind of creature which bore no similarity to a caterpillar. On her return to Amsterdam, Merian set about writing up her research for publication, producing a book which was more ambitious in scope than any she had produced before. The Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensium was published in 1705 to great acclaim. This folio-sized publication, and it is huge, it may have seen it in the library upstairs, it's, it's that big, it's amazing, was lavishly illustrated using the approach which Merian had developed with still life illustrations showing complete life cycles on the correct food plants. The 60 large scale illustrations showing the insects at exact life size were accompanied by text on which she explained her research. 
of the sphinx moth caterpillars, which she found on a grapevine, she wrote, in May of the year 1700, I found some large green caterpillars on these vine leaves, like the one shown on the stem. They eat voraciously. On 15th of May, it remained lying still and turned into a chrysalis, from which on 3rd of June, a beautiful moth emerged, green and red with stripes of a pale liver color. Its proboscis and antennae were a golden yellow. The males, one of which, here is, one of which is shown here in flight, were more beautiful than the females. The lower caterpillar also ate the leaves. When it stretched out, it was as long as the upper one. If one touched it, however, it contracted, like the one lying down the stalk, and foam ran from its mouth. About the middle of May 1700, it shed its skin and turned into a brown chrysalis, like the one on the stalk below. On the 6th of June, a beautiful grey moth with brown flecks and white stripes emerged. Its feet were white and its proboscis golden yellow. I combined these two metamorphoses on the same plate, since both ate the same food. To each, de to each description was added a short comment, which is the little uh, text you can see at the bottom there, on each of the plants depicted by Caspar Comelin of the Amsterdam Botanical Garden. The books were available in Latin or Dutch, uncolored or colored by Merian and her daughters. An uncolored volume cost 15 florins if purchased by subscription, or 18 florins if purchased after the subscription period had ended. A hand-colored volume could be acquired for 45 florins. Merian had produced a landmark in natural history, but she had also, quite intentionally, produced an important work of art too. As she tells us in the preface to the book, she intended it to appeal to natural historians and lovers of art equally. The large size of the volume meant it was not portable in the way that her earlier publications were, and it was clearly intended to be housed in a library, poured over at a table, enjoyed for its lavish illustrations, as well as for its important scientific content. Indeed, few of her readers would have the chance to use the work in the field. Instead, through her volume, Marion had brought the wonders of South American wildlife into European libraries. And Europe was delighted. Marion's book was a resounding success. In 1710, she was described as that great naturalist and artist in the Royal Society of London's Philosophical Transactions. And in August 1711, her work was featured in complementary terms in the journal Memoirs of Literature, containing a weekly account of the state of learning, both at home and abroad. The great industry and generosity of Mrs. Merriam cannot be sufficiently commended, and the lovers of natural history will doubtless receive her present with great satisfaction. This work is certainly one of the most curious performances in its kind that ever was published. In The Metamorphosis, Merian explained to her readers that she planned a second volume dealing with the reptiles of Suriname, but this was never completed, probably due to her ill health. And besides a small amount of freelance illustration, she appears to have worked little after the publication of The Metamorphosis. Merian supplemented her income by trading in exotic specimens and was able to supply examples from Suriname sent home by her daughter Johanna, who had married and moved to the colony. On the 29th of August, 1712, she wrote to James Pettiver, the London apothecary and naturalist, offering to sell him sharks, a large iguana and a small one, a sovergard lizard, a flying fish, a spider, six snakes, 2,000 bones, two lizards, an animal which is found on ships, a small fish, all in bottles with alcohol and two boxes containing insects. In 1711, a visitor to Amsterdam described her as 62 years of age, still very alert, a courtly, well-mannered woman, very skilled at watercolour and very diligent. In the same year, she made her will and the last entry in her study book. At some point in 1714 or early 1715, Dorothea recorded that she had been struck by great weakness and paralysis. The curious Maria Sibylla Merian died in January 1717 and was buried in the Leidse Kirchhof in Amsterdam. After her death, appreciation of Merian's work continued. By the end of the 18th century, the metamorphosis could be found in all the major scientific libraries of Europe. 18th century British owners included Sir Hans Sloan, Thomas Hollis Pelham, who was Earl of, or Duke of Newcastle and Prime Minister, whose copy was described as coloured from the life, so it was clearly coloured by Merian herself, 
Martin Folkes, President of the Royal Society, and there was a copy in the Library of the Royal Society of Physicians in London. In Paris, Jean-Jacques Rousseau prepared notes on Merian's life for his patron, Madame Dupin, who was planning a book on noteworthy women. In the scientific world, Merian's conclusions were examined and debated, her valuable eyewitness accounts and meticulous drawings providing new information on the wildlife of Suriname and on the process of metamorphosis. Mark Catesby studied the plates of the metamorphosis when designing his natural history of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands, which was published between 1729 and 1747. In A Natural History of English in Insects, Eleazar Albin referred to Merian and modeled his illustrations on her work with different stages of each insect's life cycle arranged on the host plant, while Moses Harris adopted the same approach in the Aurelian, or Natural History of English Insects, published in 1766. Merian's work was one of those consulted by Carolus Linnaeus for his seminal taxonomic system of natural history, published in a number of editions from 1735, and he cites her work over 130 times. I don't know if you can see it on the slide, or if it's too small here, but it says again and again and again, Merian Suriname, Merian Suriname. This is the page for Sphinx Moths. And in April 1788, in his review of the rise and progress of natural history presented to the Linnaean Society on its foundation, James Edward Smith stated, nor must I forget Madame Merian, whose excellent work on the Suriname insects, one of the most splendid in natural history, is a monument of female perseverance and enthusiasm. By the time Smith addressed the Linnaean Society, an important group of Merian's works had probably already entered the Royal Collection. Oh, sorry, there's Smith, but you, he's in the corner. I didn't need to show him to you anyway. They were acquired by George III, who was fascinated by botany, natural history, and agriculture, and who built an important library in these areas. Indeed, such was his interest in such matters that he was ridiculed by the satirists as Farmer George. We do not know when George III acquired the drawings by Merian in the Royal Collection, but they were certainly in his library by around 1810 when they were included in an inventory. By the time they were acquired by the king, the set of drawings had achieved some fame. They had been owned by the renowned doctor and collector Richard Mead and were acquired by Mead's death, or inquired after Mead's death in 1754 by an anonymous collector who put them up for auction again in 1768. At this point, they made the newspapers when it was recorded that the capital drawings of fruit, insects, etc., of the celebrated Madame Merian were sold, supposed for a certain great personage, for the sum of 201 guineas. These 95 capital drawings included luxury versions of the 60 plates from the Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensium, as well as um, European compositions. It is the luxury versions of the plates from the Metamorphosis acquired by George III that I've been showing you this evening. These are partially printed and partially hand-drawn onto vellum and richly coloured in watercolour and gouache. The use of vellum means the painted pigments are radiant, they don't sink into the surface as the pigment would with paper, and the vellum would have been particularly expensive. Although we do not know for whom the set was made, it must have been a rich and influential collector. The watercolours may have been made for Dr. Mead himself, since he travelled to the Netherlands as a young doctor and retained contacts there. A sister set of illustrations, made with the same technique, is in the British Museum and was owned by Sir Hans Sloane, a great friend and colleague of Mead. I believe that the two sets, what we might call the Mead set and the Sloan set, were made sometime in 1702 to 3, halfway through the production of the Metamorphosis. Merian's lavish publication was self funded and would have been expensive to produce. By creating these costly advanced sets, she would have been able to raise funds for her project, particularly to pay the three professional engravers who made the plates in the book for her. Just as Merian's research was innovative, so was her artistic technique. In studying these works, there's a real, stay, it's a real sense that she did not stay within the boundaries of convention, but rather adapted the techniques at her disposal to get exactly what she wanted. As we carried out research into the drawings for the exhibition Maria Merian's Butterflies, I came to realise just how interesting they were and how unpredictable Merian is as an artist. 
Working on her drawings is a little like letting out, laying out a set of playing cards and you think you've got them in the right order and then you see something and it's as if the whole pack's been thrown into the air and you've, you start again. Um, of all the artists I've worked on, it's Merian who I'd like the most chance to sit down with and to talk about her work. And my question in front of each of the drawings would be, why did you do it like this? What were you thinking here? And I suspect that in front of each drawing, her answer would be different and each answer would be fascinating and enlightening. It is the mixture of print and painting that Merian uses in the vellum sheets, which is particularly interesting. The technique is a complicated one, which would justify a whole lecture in its own right. But here I'd like to focus on what it might tell us about Merian's working practices and concerns. It was realised some years ago by Alan Donathorne, who then was head of paper conservation at Royal Collection Trust, that the basis of many of these works was printed lines. If you look at the caterpillar here, you can see there are dark lines under the caterpillar, but they are not under the, the leaf and the, the plant there. Those dark lines are printed lines. And they, here's another one. You can see that the dark lines under the moth there, but not under the vine on which it sits. So these lines don't usually occur under the whole illustration, but only under sections of the image, most usually under the animals. The printed lines on the Windsor sheets were the subject of a further in-depth study by a group of conservators at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, who published a fascinating paper on their close analysis of plate 20 of the set. And on the left there, you can see the Windsor vellum illustration of plate 20, and on the right, the finished, published version of plate 20. And what they were talking about in that wonderful Getty paper was how she used that partial printing to vary the composition. You can see that the moth is in two completely different places. Merian produced the Windsor sheets using the counterproof technique. Counterproofing is where the artist takes a print when the ink is still wet and presses it against another sheet of paper or vellum, thus transferring the printed outlines to the second sheet. And the image on the second sheet, if you can imagine it, is in reverse to the individual print. So you've got your original printing plate and if you press it on a sheet of paper, you have a wet print, it's in reverse. You press it on another sheet of paper and you, you've reversed the image again. So what I'm showing you here is a, an ordinary printing on the left um, in, in the, way, the same way that the library volumes you might have seen. Those are, those are ordinary printing and on the right, the Royal Collection volume, which is a counterproof printing. Merrin used counterproofing not only to produce the luxury vellum pictures, but also these volumes, which would have sold for a higher price. But quite why she did so is unclear. The printed lines in counterproofs are fainter, meaning the plates look more delicate. And counterproof prints had long had a cachet for print collectors who would pay a higher price for them. We also need to consider Merrin the canny businesswoman who might have considered the possibility of getting two images out of one an advantage. But as we have seen, Merian did not counterproof whole plates to make the luxury versions, but rather sections of them. And furthermore, Merian does not use this opportunity to vary the design of the individual plates throughout the set. Some of them are exact replicas of the finished illustrations in the metamorphosis. Most interestingly, among those which are exactly the same are 13 works at Windsor, which are not based on any printing but which are entirely drawn freehand. So the vellum illustration you can see on the right there is entirely freehand. There's no printing under that, but she has entirely followed the finished, the finished composition. There is no variation. It is here that Merriam would have had the most chance to vary her design, but here she chose not to do so at all. How can this be explained? I think the answer lies in a letter which Merriam wrote to the English apothecary James Pettiver, on the 20th of June, 1703, in which she discussed the progress of her work. In this letter, Merian told Petiver, 13 plates have already been finished. Is it possible to suggest that the 13 illustrations at Windsor, which have no underlying printing, are these first 13 plates to be finished? Because when Merian made the Windsor set, she had already handed the copper plates over to the engravers and could not take prints from them. If so, we can deduce that the first plates that Merian worked on were these 13, and that she did not, for some reason, work on the volume sequentially, from plate 1 to plate 60. In other cases, we can show that the etching of the plate was largely complete before Merian took her partial counterproofs. And a good illustration of this is the wonderfully vibrant illustration of plate 29 of the metamorphosis of the life cycle of a green-banded uranium moth on a pomelo. 
Here, if you look closely, you can see that the cross hatching appears under the caterpillar's feet, showing that the etching on the plate was complete. And if you um, look down, you can see a very clear line where she's masked off that plate somehow and, and the etching et lines disappear. Here it seems that we have evidence that Marion etched the initial lines onto the plates of the metamorphosis herself before passing them on to the professional engravers to be completed. And this may be a reason that she made these, these luxury sets because the first 13 print plates were largely done by a single printmaker. And I do wonder if she realized that this one printmaker, this one engraver, who was excellent, just didn't have the capacity to make the whole volume. She needed to bring in two other printmakers and she needed to raise the funds. And this is why the Windsor and the British Museum sets were made. If this is the case, then I would like to suggest that the Windsor sets sheets show evidence of Merriam's increasing experimentation with her medium. With the first 13 plates, she stuck to the final composition. But as she continued to make the luxury vellum illustrations, I think she varied the compositions more and more. So by the time she reached plates 17 and 39, she'd become bolder and placing her moths and butterflies in different orientations, moving them around the page to suit her whim. Essentially, she's setting the insects free again on the page, allowing them to move around her compositions as if they were alive rather than dead specimens. I can only think that this was done for her own pleasure and artistic satisfaction, so that working on the luxury vellum sets became a process of continued creation rather than simple reproduction. Again, Marion didn't take the easy course, but one which provided her with the most fulfillment. She was a past master at finding ways to achieve her ends, be it selling her studio and sailing to Suriname, or adapting the techniques of print and paint to achieve works as close to her vision as she could get. It is for this reason that she is the most fascinating artist I have ever had the privilege of studying. She is endlessly challenging and endlessly fascinating. But even if we accept Merian's unusual nature as an artist, there is so much more to learn about the Windsor Sheets. And I thought it might be interesting to finish, not with conclusions, but with some of the questions that still occupy and puzzle me. Any suggestions, very gratefully received. If you can solve these problems, I'd be very, very grateful. Who wrote, cost u gilda without charges on the back of the drawing of a harlequin beetle and Julia butterfly? We've looked at this over and over again, and we cannot think that that is not a u. Um, it might be a two, I can't make it out, but it looks like a U to me. This is someone who's using a Netherlandish currency, but writing in English. Is this the moment that the drawings came from the Netherlands to England? Are the charges a customs levy of some sort? Why does only one of the metamorphosis illustrations bear an inscription with Merian's name? Is it an inscription or a signature? How do the Windsor and British Museum sets relate to each other? They're very similar, but with very small differences, suggesting they were made at slightly different times. And the most interesting one is the, the, the famous illustration of the spiders. And the Windsor, set, the Windsor version of that is entirely based on printed lines. And the British Museum version, I can see no printed lines at all. So is there a slight lag between the two? Has she handed that plate over to the engravers between making the Windsor and the British Museum sets? Why did Marion choose to combine printing and painting in a way that can only have increased her workload? And who was she making these venturous, rigorous, beautiful illustrations for? The more we look closely at Marion's work, the more we understand about her life, her art, her research, and her world. There is something terribly satisfying in this, since it, since it is through looking closely that Marion sought to discover, and something that she encouraged her readers to do as well. Phrases such as seen through a magnifying glass are scattered through her work. It is through looking closely that scientists and artists pursue their work, and it can be no coincidence that Marion's artistic education, which encouraged her to examine things with great care, made her such an effective researcher of natural history, research that she was able to express through such brilliant, beautiful images. Her work has had a tremendous influence on those who came after her, in both artistic and scientific fields, and she is deservedly remembered as an outstanding pioneer. Not such a curious performance, after all. Thank you. Thank you.